أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ورسلا قد قصصناهم عليك من قبل ورسلا لم نقصصهم عليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده أما بعد Brothers and sisters, it's been a very, very long hiatus from our series, The Stories of the Prophets and I know there has been a lot of uh, requests and demand uh, and so Alhamdulillah, Bismillah, in the name of Allah, with the help of Allah, asking the blessings of Allah let us resume uh, this series and for a quick recap I uh, have spent a considerable amount of time um, talking about the benefits from the story of our father Adam and some of the uh, questions and issues that arise from that. And as you have seen in that uh, series, uh, I am following uh, a methodology uh, that is perhaps somewhat different uh, than many others who speak of these uh, stories. And I am separating what our actual tradition says, meaning the Quran and Sunnah, I should say what our actual Wahi says, from what later scholars might have derived, from what archaeologists might say, and raising issues that uh, um, we, a person of our times is going to be questioning and wondering about. And there's no doubt that when a person does this, uh, and does things that people are not accustomed to, especially some in the scholarly class, there's no doubt that there's going to be um, uh, objections raised, people will be, uh, um, you know, uh, somewhat disturbed, some of them. And so be it, I have presented my evidences, I do not claim that they are 100% correct. I have given my opinions, and I leave it uh, uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to judge and reward for the sincerity. And then after that, to uh, the uh, erudite scholars to correct or to accept as they see fit. If there's any benefit, it is from Allah. If there's any mistakes, it is from myself and from shaitan. And I say all of this because we now begin uh, our second part after doing the story of Adam. And uh, frankly, um, I'm not going to be regurgitating what is found in most of the books that talk about Qasas al-Anbiya or the stories of the prophets. If you listen to the vast majority of preachers and teachers, they will be more than happy to tell you what is found in good books. Nothing wrong with reading the books. Ibn Kathir's, you know, Qasas al-Anbiya, for example, which is basically a selection of his tariq or al-Tabari in his tariq. But I mean, um, as I have explained in the past, al-Tabari and Ibn Kathir, with utmost love and respect to them, they're basically taking this information and knowledge from Judeo-Christian sources and those Judeo-Christian sources really are not frankly worth any academic merit. I mean again being brutally honest here because we have to understand what Allah revealed to the Prophet Musa alayhi salam and all of the Prophets. Uh, the, the methodology of Allah Azza wa in revealing Sunnah Allah, the, the Sunnah of Allah Azza wa Look at our Quran. The stories that are mentioned are meant for moral reflection. It is not the sunnah of Allah to give geneal gene genealogical tables 20 pages long, for example, that are found in the Old and New Testament, and to give every single detail the way a chronology or history was written. This is the methodology of mankind, where we go into all of these details and we bore the readers and whatnot. So the question arises that from where did the ancient rabbis and the children of Israel themselves get this information? And the response to this is, we do not know and we shall never know. Perhaps some of it, perhaps some of it comes from uh, uh, the Prophet Musa alayhi salam telling them various things. But the bulk of it, really, uh, it, it's basically a type of mythology. And all you need to do is to look at the creation story in Genesis, to look at various things that we know factually to be uh, untrue, the six days and, you know, God created this and then this and then this and whatnot. We know these to be, frankly, not actually academically correct. We thank Allah our Quran doesn't have any problems like this at all. We thank Allah for that. So if we know for a fact then that uh, the Judeo-Christian chronology of events doesn't really bear a lot of academic merit well then even if we narrate it as i will because you should know that they say that 
We're simply narrating it so that you're aware this is what they say. And this is what is found in their books. And this is what Ibn Kathir took and Al-Tabari took. You should be aware. But for me as a person, you know, living in this time and place with the knowledge that we have, to actually believe in this uh, type of genealogy or in this type of um, uh, history, uh, that's not, I, I, Allah didn't tell us this. The Prophet ﷺ did not tell us this. Yes, if Allah says so in the Quran, no doubt we accept. If the Prophet ﷺ says so, he's speaking from Ilm al ghaib But if we find it in, you know, Tafsir uh, Tariq al Tabari, if we find it from Ka'b al Ahbar, from even a Tabi'i or even a Sahabi, because as we said, Ibn Abbas and other radiallahu anhum, it was common for them to narrate from Israeliyat and they didn't find an issue with this. And there's no theological harm, there's no sin, but at the same time, it's not a fact. And when we know in our times that much of this is simply not true, so we have to have this kernel there. I say all of this introduction because today's two interesting figures, fact of the matter is we hardly know anything about them from the actual wahi of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What we do know is what people tens of thousands of years later have said. So I'm going to narrate this. I realize in the end of the day, it's what they have said. And there is no verification. Frankly, much of it simply does not add up. But khair, it is what it is. So we begin with the first person we will discuss. And that is the uh, person by the name of Sheath, or in English and, and Latin, Seth, Sheath. Now, Sheath is allegedly the younger son of Adam alayhi salam. Qarun, uh, uh, Qabil and Habil, sorry, Qabil and Habil are the older sons. And according to, again, legend, uh, there was the third son, Sheath. Now, uh, according to some versions of Judeo Christian sources, Adam and Hawa only had three sons, not many, many sons. This is one version of events. And so Sheath was the younger son. Now, we know from the Quran, I already mentioned the story of Qabil and Habil. And so Sheath is their younger uh, brother that comes into the picture. Is he mentioned in our sources? Well, the Quran does not give any indication of sheath, not directly, not indirectly. And as for the sunnah, the name of sheath is not found in any of the uh, classical 10 collections of hadith, uh, the six along with Muslim Imam Ahmad, along with the Mu'ta and other, the, the classical 10, or you call them, he's not found in any of those. However, uh, his name does occur in the Musnad of Ibn Hibban and al tabaranis Al-Kabir and others. So it does. it is found in what we call the tertiary sources, not the primary hadith, not the secondary, the tertiary sources of hadith. And the hadith is a very, very long one. So I actually brought the hadith so that we can benefit a little bit from it. And then we'll discuss its authenticity. The book I have in my hand is the famous book of Ibn Hibban, uh, which has been restructured and um reordered by the famous hadith called Ibn Bilibban because Ibn Hib, so get, don't get confused, Ibn Hibban and Ibn Bilibban, they sound uh, similar, but they're two very different people. Ibn Hibban wrote his book uh, and arranged it in a very, very, very obscure and difficult manner. Uh, your mind would go in loops trying to understand his arrangement. And so Ibn Bilibban comes along a few centuries later and rearranges Ibn Hibban in a way that it's user friendly. We can understand and read it. So the way that Ibn Hibban has been printed is according to the arrangement of Ibn Bilibban. So uh, in this arrangement or the restructuring uh, in a volume uh, 2, page 3, page 76, hadith number 361, there is a hadith with a long chain because again Ibn Hibban is in the 4th century, way after Bukhari, almost 200 years after, 180 years after Bukhari. So uh, Ibn Hibban has a long chain back to uh, Abu Idris al-Khawalani from Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, who says, I entered the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he was sitting by himself. The hadith goes on and on. It is literally one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, six, uh, six pages completely of text. So it's one of those hadith that Frankly, most scholars of hadith automatically know one of the signs of a weak or very weak hadith is pages and pages of text. Nobody can memorize, you know, an entire five, ten paragraphs simply from memory. When you find a hadith that is just long pages of text, generally something is, is you know, not right with it. And this is one of those. So this is a long uh, uh, hadith. We went over it, by the way, uh, right at the beginning of our lecture series, uh, because it is this hadith in which the Prophet was asked 
Ya Rasulullah, how many anbiya? So the Prophet said 124,000. Then he said, Ya Rasulullah, how many rusul? And the Prophet said 310 and something, a large quantity. Then he said, Ya Rasulullah, who was the first of them? So the Prophet said, Adam. Then uh, Abu Dhar said, Ya Rasulullah, was he a Nabi whom Allah sent? So uh, uh, the Prophet allegedly responded, Yes, Allah created him with his hand and blew his ruh into him and spoke to him directly. Then the Prophet allegedly says, O Abu Dhar, four of them were Assyriac. Four of them were Assyrian ethnically. Assyrian. So uh, Assyrianiyun, Assyrians. Uh, it's an ethnicity and it is an ancient civilization. Four of them were Assyrian. Adam and Sheath and Akhnukh, and that is Idris. And he was the first who wrote with a pen and Nuh. So according to this hadith, four prophets were Assyrian or Syriac. Adam and Sheath, that's the only time his name is mentioned in hadith. And Akhnukh, and he is Idris. Memorize this phrase. It is directly in the hadith. Akhnukh wa huwa Idris. So Idris is Akhnukh. And Idris was the first to write with a pen in this hadith. And Nuh. Then he said, four were from the Arabs, O Abu Dhar. Hud and Shu'ayb and Salih and your Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then Abu Dhar said, O Messenger of Allah, how many books did Allah reveal? The Prophet allegedly said 100 books. Four of them were uh, larger books. Mi'atu kitab wa arba'atu kudub is unzil ala sheath khamsuna sahifa. Sheath was given 50 sahifa scrolls. So again, we have sheath over here. And Akhnukh was given 30 Sahifa. And Ibrahim was given 10 Sahifa. And Musa was given before the Torah, Torah uh, 10 Sahifa. And then Allah revealed the Torah and Injil and Zabur and Quran. These are the four that are Kutub, right? So how many uh, books did Allah reveal? 100 books. Four of them are really significant books. And then uh, the Prophet mentions these uh, uh, five here, four here, ten here, ten here. And of them, it says that uh, Sheath got 50 Sahifas. 50 Sahifas. Like a huge quantity were given to Sheath. Akhnukh gets 30 and then on and on. And then the Hadith uh, goes on and on, but that's not relevant to us in this particular lecture series. Now, this is the only time that Sheath is mentioned in an alleged Hadith. As I went over uh, way when I started the story of Adam alayhi we went over this hadith for the number of prophets. This hadith is not just weak, it is very, very weak. Uh, and uh, honestly, the, the signs of it not being authentic are beginning to end. Um, of them, like I said, is the length. And of them is this extreme amount of minute detail that again would be bizarre to find. And of them, frankly, even the history mentioned in it. So to claim that Adam, the first man, is uh, a Syrian, just doesn't make any sense. The Assyrian civilization, indeed it is one of the most ancient, and perhaps the people at that time frame would have thought that it is the most ancient civilization. But we know for a fact that the Assyrians weren't the first of mankind. The Assyrians lived 2000 BC, 3000 BC at max, right? Before them, there were plenty of humans and plenty of uh, people around there. The Assyrians are a developed civilization. There were human beings before them. How can Adam be Assyriac? How can Adam be a later uh, ethnicity? It does not make any sense. In fact, how can Adam be any civilization? He's the founder of all civilizations. So to claim that Adam is Assyriac, it shows us that this is not coming from the Wahi, from uh, a source that is 100% authentic. These are the standard folklores and legends that permeate, you know, for the first 300 years. And then sometimes, you know, uh, accidentally, that's what a ta'if hadith and what a weak hadith and what a forged fabricated hadith indicates. Because when we say the hadith is fabricated or very, very weak, essentially what we're saying is that in all likelihood, somebody is saying this and then a mistake occurs and somebody back projects it to the mouth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we say then that uh, there is no authentic mention of sheath, uh, Seth in the Quran and the Sunnah, but because he occurs in a Da'if hadith, 
a very da'if hadith. Let's just mention very quickly about some of the things that are mentioned in the folkloric tradition. As for the Quran and Sunnah, as we said, authentic Sunnah has nothing about uh, sheath. Now, what is mentioned in the books of tafsir then, because now we have this uh, uh, alleged hadith mentioned here, so automatically it's going to bring about some discussions and some references uh, from the Sahaba and Tabi'un. And so we have, for example, a tabari mentions a number of things about sheath, both in his tafsir and in his tariq. So a tabari uh, has a, a, a statement attributed to Ibn Abbas, in which he said that when Adam alayhi salam died, Sheath said to Jibreel that, O oh Jibreel, pray the salat over Adam. And Jibreel said to Sheath, actually, you pray over your own father. And then he taught Sheath how to pray salat al janaza And he said, say the takbir 30 times. Five of them is how you're supposed to pray Salat al janaza and the rest of the 25 is a blessing and a takrim and an honor for the Prophet Adam. So this is again one of those uh, traditions we find. Uh, and again, I mean, uh, as we are, as I have said before, a lot of these types of legends and stories, they are apocryphal in nature and we simply narrate them and leave it as it is. And there are also other famous storytellers in our tradition um, the most famous early storyteller, uh, perhaps I did mention his name in the, in the previous sections I've did. If I haven't, then we can introduce him now. Uh, and that is uh, uh, the famous storyteller that uh, who was perhaps the first um, very famous carved a niche for himself, uh, Qassas or the storyteller, and he is Wahab, uh, who would tell these legendary stories and was recorded by and large uh, and, and his stories were actually compiled in a book. By and large, uh, this person, Wahab, uh, is not considered to be an authority in any sense of the term. And in fact, he's not even considered to be a scholar. But because he happened to be the first at the right time in the right place, all that he said took on a certain weight and it trickled down into quite mainstream sources, including al tabari including Ibn Qutayba and others who mentioned these types of legends and stories. So once again, in today's lecture, I'm simply telling you what others said. And uh, in our actual analysis, all of this is simply tales. You should simply be aware for general information's sake. So Wahab says, and this phrase of his ends up in Al-Tabari and Ibn Qutayba and others. Wahab says that Sheath, the son of Adam, was the most handsome of all the children of Adam and the best of the children of Adam and the one who resembled Adam the most and the one whom Adam loved the most. And he was the one whom Adam handed the legacy, the torch was passed down to him. He was the one who took charge after Adam. And he is the father of all other children of Adam. After Adam's generation, everybody goes through sheath. The other uh, uh, two sons did not have sons that lasted on for many generations, according to Wahab, that uh, all of the children of Adam in our times are descendants of uh, sheath. And According to Wahab, Sheath was the one who first built the Kaaba uh, with brick and clay. And uh, uh, Allah sent upon Sheath 50 Sahifas. Now that phrase is found in that weak hadith, which shows you that there was this notion from back in the day that Sheath was inspired with the first book to be sent down, and that is 50 Sahifas. Uh, and Sheath lived for 912 years. And Sheath gave birth to Anush, uh, and many other children, and Anush had a son called Qinan, and Qinan had a son called Mahlayil, and Mahlayil had a son called Yarid, and Yarid had a son called Akhnukh, and that is Idris, and then Idris had a son and a son and a son, and then Nuh. So this is a standard biblical lineage, by the way. What he is saying is the Arabicized names that are found in the Bible. According to the Bible, Akhnukh or Idris becomes the seventh son of Adam, and uh, Nuh becomes the tenth son of uh, Adam. There's an even more fanciful tale that honestly, I'm, I'm not even going to go into the details because it is so bizarre, but I'm simply saying it because it is found in Tabaqat of Ibn Sa'd and it is found in other source books that are overall reputable. But again, when we say they're reputable, the reputable when, when they talk about their domain. Ibn Sa'd's Tabaqat is meant to discuss the Sahaba Tabi'un Taba Tabi'un. When you find information in that generation, take it. But Ibn Sa'ad also has a discussion of the previous ummas and nations. So does Al-Tabari. 
So when At-Tabari and Ibn Sa'd are talking about what they've eyewitnessed or what happened in the generation right before them or whatnot, then yes, that's definitely very, very weighty. But when At-Tabari tells you what allegedly happened 100,000 years ago, because again, we talked about you know Adam and whatnot, when did they live? And Allah knows best when they lived, but it might have been 100,000 years ago. Uh, so when At-Tabari mentions the stories of Seeth, Sheth, uh, um, uh, Seth is the English and Sheath is the Arabic one. When, uh, when Tabari mentions their stories, we take it with a grain of salt. But nonetheless, we find this story in At-Tabaqat and others in which, again, allegedly uh, that Adam told Sheath on his deathbed that make sure your sons do not marry the daughters of Qabil, of Cain, because Cain's family is all astray. So your son should not marry the daughters of Qabil. And so Sheath took his sons and lived away from the daughters and their children after them. And so uh, after a generation or a hundred years or whatever, again, all of this, you can just listen to it. And you know, this is mythology. These are the tales of the ancients that people used to say back then. Their mentalities were different and they they had no problems believing in these tales. In our times, it's literally like a, a tale out of a children's book. And we know these types of things didn't actually happen. So the children of you know, uh, uh, the children of Sheath apparently lived on the mountains and the, and the daughters of Qabi lived on the shores. And one day the children of, of Sheath, uh, the sons of Sheath, uh, Sheath came down and saw the beautiful daughters and they were enticed and they were uh, uh, commanded or they were uh, seduced to commit zina. And so zina became common and then sharab al-khamr became common and alcohol became common. And so, you know, Allah Azza wa Jal then sent in the next few generations the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. Again, all of these, uh, as I said, we should just simply be aware and there's no actual uh, shred of evidence for any of this actually taking place. Uh, an interesting side note is that uh, because sheath is mentioned in this regard and because it is said that 50 suhuf or 50 sahifa scrolls came down, sheath is given a very high status in some of the most exotic and ancient and esoteric uh, faith traditions of our times. In particular, uh, the Mandaeans and the Yazidis. Uh, both the Mandaeans and the Yazidis uh, consider Sheath to be a very seminal figure in their religions. So just a very interesting anecdote or interesting tidbit. For some of you who might not know who they are, the Mandaeans are one of the smallest religions in the world today. And they are one of the most ancient religions. And they're one of the most secretive religions. And uh, it is rare to uh, come across any of them. In fact, and I am who I am. I have yet to actually physically meet a Mandaean. I travel and I meet with people of all faiths and whatnot. I've never actually to this day physically met uh, a Mandaean. Of course, if I really wanted to, I could go out. And, but I, in my day-to-day -day life that I travel and whatnot, not one. There are probably uh, less than 60,000 left in the world today. Uh, and they go back uh, pre-Christianity. They go back to uh, uh, Allah knows when, how many millennia they go back to. And uh, they are the ones whom the Qur'an references uh, The Sabi'un, the Sabians The Sabi'un, these are in our times called the Mandaeans they, What they call themselves and what the people call them What the academic literature calls them is Mandaeans And uh, the Mandaeans are a Gnostic faith uh, Gnosticism is a whole different trend They have their own beliefs about soul And the tension between this world and the hereafter And this element of dualism Which is common throughout all of Gnosticism uh, But the Mandaeans Clearly in my opinion And I, I've only studied them uh, you know, A little bit In my humble opinion I think it is obvious that The Mandaeans do go back to some uh, Prophetic uh, revelation To some basis of the Sharia They have clear Tawheed Belief in one God they have a clear understanding of the hereafter and the soul being immortal uh, and heaven and hell. They believe in prophets. And in fact, the main prophet they revere is Yahya, John the Baptist, believe it or not. And they believe that Sheath taught John the Baptist and that Sheath is the mentor of John the Baptist. And they call him Sheetal, Sheetal. They call Sheath Sheetal. And they consider him to be uh, the, uh, the son of Adam who became the mentor of John the Baptist. By the way, the Mandaeans, they pray regularly three or five times a day, some say seven times a day, uh, and they have very strict rules of doing ghusl from Janaba. They, they have to bathe regularly uh, and the water has to be running. So Mandaeans are found, by the way, I forgot to mention, they're found in Iraq. They are Iraqis 
historically, an area of Iraq where the Mandaeans uh, of recent, there has been a migration to some European lands, but still the majority of them are in Iraq. And uh, they are uh, a group that prays, that fasts. They have a system of fasting. They do ghusl. They wash themselves before they pray. They're very strict on uh, purity uh, and cleanliness. And they have versions of the sharia and uh, aqidah that we would recognize. And our classical scholars, many of them consider them to be a part of the Ahli Kitab. And I also consider this to be the case that we should treat them the way that the Ahli Kitab are treated in our Sharia because of their beliefs and their theology. Uh, so this is the Mandaeans. Interestingly enough, they are uh, people who revere sheath immensely in their tradition. By the way, so there's levels amongst them and uh, their priestly class is a very elitist class. And you must be initiated. So they're a secretive religion. They're not supposed to tell you too much. They don't accept converts at all. You cannot convert to Mandaeanism. And uh, what else about them? Yeah, so apparently there's only 20 of their priests left uh, alive today. They're a very small group as it is. And very few are chosen to be priests. And so they're a dwindling uh, civilization. Uh, interesting, um, you know, tidbit of history. But anyway, they are people who revere Shi. That's why we, the, their name came up. Also, the Yazidis are perhaps one of the most, for, from our perspectives, um, very interesting. Uh, and of course, theologically very bizarre. And I don't mean this, I mean, just saying theologically, they're very uh, interesting group. Let's, let me put it that way. They have come into the news because of ISIS and the massacres against them and the taking of their women and whatnot. And obviously, these are travesties that we don't support uh, that should not be done. Uh, but uh, that's why they have come into the news. The Yazidis, they also go back a long time. They are a syncretic faith. What is syncretic faith? A syncretic faith is a faith that has taken from two or three and then merged it to produce a new faith tradition. The Yazidis are not Muslim. They don't consider themselves Muslim, but they have Islamic terminologies and motifs, but they are not Muslim. And they go back to a very ancient religion. Uh, when Islam came to that region of Iraq, uh, at some point in time, this religion uh, adopted elements of Islam, but still retained elements of Islam, meaning the name Allah and whatnot is found. And you know they have a, their own terminology, shaitan and whatnot. Uh, and uh, so they have their terminologies, but in reality, their faith tradition goes back to not even Zoroastrianism, the precursor to Zoroastrianism. So that which Zoroastrianism came from, uh, there were a group of people that were still upon that old school religion. And at some point in time, uh, Sheikh Adi, a Muslim theologian, came to them, tried to teach them Tawheed, tried to preach them. They respected him, they admired him. But after he passed away, they took some of his true teachings of Islam and they retained their original and they kind of sort of brought forth what is now called Yazidism. And there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, with regards to who they are, what they are. The common perception, uh, they are called devil worshippers, uh, but that's a common misconception. They don't actually technically worship the devil, but uh, they have a bizarre mythology in which Iblis becomes a venerated figure. And because of this, these types of uh, these types of uh, things have gone. Why are we talking about them today or right now? Well, once again, because Sheath becomes one of the main personas of the Yazidi uh, tradition as well, and he becomes the keeper of secrets, etc., etc. Now, uh, from our perspectives, uh, from my perspective as somebody who studies history and, and academics and intellectual history, I think it is obvious to me that Sheath, uh, if he existed, because we really don't even know if he did exist, if he existed, he becomes the type of figure that these movements conveniently find an excuse to tack on their beliefs and religions to, right? So he actually becomes a mythical figure. Even if he existed, the persona that he actually was is completely irrelevant now. He becomes this secretive figure who was given so much alleged, alleged knowledge, even in this life hadith, 50 scriptures given to him and 10 given to some other prophets. Think about that. So even from that time, you have this notion, which is again, not from the Prophet. The hadith is very weak. It's not the Prophet I'm saying this, but the notion that he has a lot of knowledge and he becomes a hidden and mystical figure. And so that's why these groups like the Mandaeans or the Yazidis or whatnot, they link and latch onto the persona of a sheath. And apparently, apparently some of these movements claim that they actually have the teachings of sheath in book form. Now again, these are both Yazidis and the Mandaeans are extremely secretive. 
and we do not have access to their entire books to this day. They do not publish them. They don't. You don't walk into store and buy them. So there is the legend or the the claim that they have preserved the original teachings of uh, Sheath. Obviously, from our perspective, that is simply not possible. Uh, they might have had some things from uh, previous prophets and whatnot that have been corrupted over time. We don't believe any book has been preserved other than the Quran. In any case, that is uh, what we have to say about the Prophet Sheath. And we'll quickly move on to another prophet whom we have just a little bit more information about, but basically that is it. And that is Idris alayhi salam. Idris alayhi salam. Now the Prophet Idris, unlike Sheath, is mentioned in the Quran and mentioned twice. And both of these are mentioned in passing. We do not have any incident or story of Idris in the Quran uh, whatsoever. But we do have two references. The first, Surah Maryam, verse 56. وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِدْرِيسِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَدِّيقًا نَبِيًّا وَرَفَعْنَاهُ مَكَانًا عَلِيًّا Mention in the book Idris. Mention the name of Idris in the book. He was a righteous person and he was a Nabi. And we raised him to a high place. Now, Surah Maryam, Surah Maryam mentions many prophets. It begins with mentioning Zakaria, moves on to Isa and Maryam, her, her, his mother. Then it goes back to Ibrahim chronologically. Then mentions Ishaq and Ya'qub in passing in one verse. Then jumps forward to Musa alayhi salam, uh, who is of course in between Ibrahim and Isa. Then briefly mentions Harun. Then goes back to Ismail. And then the very last prophet mentioned in Surah Maryam is Idris. Idris. So Idris is mentioned in a longer, uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a chapter, in a surah that mentions all of these other prophets and the surah does not go in chronological order. It's important to mention this because Idris comes at the end even though the claim is that he's at the beginning chronologically. But that would match the style of the surah if that were the case. The second time that Idris is mentioned is Surah Al-Anbiya verse 85 and once again this is just in passing just a list Allah mentions Surah Anbiya mentions lots of prophets that's why it's called the Surah of Prophets and Allah says that وَإِسْمَعِيلَ وَإِدْرِيسَ وَذَا الْكِفْلِ كُلُّمْ مِنَ الصَّابِرِينَ وَأَدْخَلْنَاهُمْ فِي رَحْمَتِنَا and Ismail and Idris and Dhul Kifl all of them were from the patient people and we included all of them in our mercy so, once again, in passing. By the way, it is interesting to note that Idris is mentioned uh, after Ismail, both in Surah Maryam and in Surah Al-Anbiya. Why this is the case, I do not know. Uh, but there does seem to be an intentional reason why Ismail is mentioned in both times. Idris is only mentioned twice. And both of these times, it is right after the name of Ismail. In Surah Maryam, Ismail is mentioned uh, and then the next verse mentions Idris and in Surah Anbiya, the same verse wa Ismaila wa Idrisa wa Dhul Kifli. Ismail and Idris and Dhul Kifl all were from the patient. So this is what the Quran says. Now, here we have a Quranic one phrase wa rafa'nahu makanan aliya. We raised Idris to a very high maqam, makan. We raised him to a very high level. What does this mean? Well, if we turn to the tafsir literature, once again, we find a whole bunch of stories, a whole bunch of interesting anecdotes, uh, some of which are clearly coming out of the Judeo-Christian sources. So, for example, one of them, perhaps the most famous one, is once again from the infamous Ka'b al-Ahbar. Remember, we talked about Ka'b so many times. Ka'b happens to uh, be a Jewish rabbi who converted to Islam at the right time and place. His father, his grandfather, rabbis, he is coming from an alim class. He is, he is a very knowledgeable rabbi. As a young man, he converts to Islam and he interacts with the first generation of Sahaba, i.e. he misses the Prophet ﷺ. He doesn't, he's not a Sahabi. So he interacts with Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anh. He accompanies him to the conquest of Jerusalem. And he is a senior person of knowledge in the first generation. And so there is no denying that he was given a certain status and respect. And again, go back to what Ibn Khaldun said, that the people of that time and place, they viewed uh, the Judeo-Christian civilization with a type of awe and a type of respect. And they took what they would say with 
uh, a certain weight that they considered it to be inherently better than paganism, which of course it was. And so because of this, much of what Ka'ab said went unchallenged. And some of it was absorbed by people whom we respect from our tradition as well. And everybody knows this. Every student of knowledge and alim knows this, that some of the early uh, tabi'un and even sahaba, they took from Ka'b al-Ahbar. And that's not a problem. As I said, it's not a sin to do so. But now that we're looking back at the literature, we have to just say, well, this is not necessarily uh, authentic. It is something from Ka'b. So what did Ka'b say about Idris? Well, listen to this tale. And again, somebody can say, um, uh, how do we know it didn't happen? To which I respond, we do not know it didn't happen. But the question is, which one is more likely of the two? That Ka'b is simply narrating from the Israeliyat or that this is something that actually happened, you know, seven, eight thousand or ten thousand years ago whenever Idris lived. So what is the story? The story goes as follows. And again, by the way, even the story itself does not make sense logically or from an Aqidah standpoint. But again, Allah knows best. Uh, the, the story goes as follows that Idris allegedly, the Prophet Idris, wanted to renegotiate his time of death with the angel of death. Pause here. Right there. This makes no sense. No prophet of Allah would renegotiate the time of death with the angel of death. The angel of death doesn't control death. It doesn't make any sense. Anyway, khair, what the report says. So Idris wanted to renegotiate his time of death. He wanted to live longer so that he can do better deeds and whatnot. So he convinced an angel to take him up to the heavens to talk to the angel of death. Again, pause here. Angels don't, the Quran tells us we don't do anything except if Allah allows us. We cannot just do anything like this. So again, theologically, the story, honestly, frankly, we should just reject it. But khair, it is found in Tafsir al-Tabar. It is found in mainstream collections. It is what it is. So apparently, Idris rides on the back of an angel. And the angel is fluttering upwards, taking him up into the heavens. And as he's going upwards in the fourth heavens, lo and behold, who should they see other than the angel of death coming down? And so the angel of death sees this angel coming up with a man on his back. Goes, hey, whoa, what you doing here? What's going on? Tell me. And the angel of this angel says, oh, I'm just taking Idris up, you know, uh, to meet you actually. What are you doing here? Right? So, and the angel of death says, of course, that's not the actual wording. You can tell him being facetious. I don't believe this actually happened. So the angel of death then says to this angel, who is on your back? And the angel says, Idris. And the angel of death allegedly says, oh my God, how crazy is this? I was told by Allah to take Idris's soul in the fourth heavens. And I was thinking, how could I take his soul in the fourth heavens when he's on earth? And actually he's over here. And so apparently uh, the soul was taken in the fourth heaven. And this is what Allah says, وَرَفَعْنَاهُ مَكَانًا عَلِيًّا And we raised him to a high makan, meaning he was in the fourth heavens and then he died up over there. Ibn Hajar comments, and it was what we expect him to comment, that the fact that Idris was raised up as when he was alive, this is not mentioned in any uh, authentic report that we should rely upon. This is exactly what we believe. It's not mentioned in anything like this. Um, another interpretation, again, coming from the Tabi'un. So again, we don't have to take it. Uh, Mujahid, who has some very interesting views, both about Jesus and others. Mujahid said that Idris was raised up alive to... Uh, Jannah, just like Isa was raised up alive to Jannah. So that is an opinion of Mujahid. That Mujahid said that Idris was also alive and he was raised up to Jannah. Well then if he's alive, is he still alive? Did he die in Jannah? What's going to happen? Again, silence here. And again, we have to understand that um, it's understood in early development of ideas. You're going to find these strange opinions. So be it. it's an opinion of Mujahid. It doesn't have to mean much it is something that he believed or felt or whatever it is what it is uh so uh, yet another opinion is that he uh was raised up uh and died in the sixth heaven and whatnot now uh the majority opinion of our scholars is that idris was the first prophet after sheath and that idris is the same as Akhnuch, or in english enoch or enoch uh, the Bible has Enoch, right? E-N-O-C-H. And uh, in Arabic, Akhnuch. And so the majority opinion is that Idris is Akhnuch. And that Idris is a title. And Akhnuch is the name. 
And even one of the scholars of the past said Idris is called Idris because he was the first to really teach. So he becomes Idris. Now once again, with utmost love and respect to our scholarly tradition, when you read in verbs uh, and nouns that are Arabic into ancient names, you know something isn't fully academic because the Arabic language uh, is a developed language. It existed for a period of time and it still exists. It did not exist since the beginning of time. We've talked about this when I talked about the languages of Adam alayhi salam. We know for a fact that people did not speak what we would recognize as Arabic, 200 CE, 100 CE. They spoke proto-Arabic. They spoke a version which is, you know, not recognizable to us, but it would eventually become Arabic. Because Allah revealed the Quran, we now have, alhamdulillah, by and large, classical Arabic preserved. But otherwise, you know, uh, to say that, Idris or Adam or whatnot spoke Arabic, it does not make any sense as we said. And I went over this in my previous uh, lectures here. So uh, the first opinion, as I said, is that Idris is none other than Akhnukh or uh, Enoch. Now, those who say that Idris is Akhnukh or Enoch, then it would make sense for me to mention him now. First there was Adam, then allegedly Sheath, and then Idris, and then Nuh will come. According to the Bible, Enoch is the great grandfather of Nuh. Enoch is the great grandfather of Nuh, so the grandfather's father. And therefore, he would be the seventh uh, descendant of Adam, and therefore, three names above Nuh. Nuh, the son of so and so, so and so, it's the son of Enoch. And this opinion is supported by the weak narration I just quoted you from Ibn Hibban. Remember, I said, remember the narration. Akhnukh wa huwa Idris. Remember, I said that? That is found in this weak report. Akhnukh wa huwa Idris. And this is the position of Al Tabari and of Ibn Kathir and of Ibn Sa'd and of quite a number of early authors that Idris is none other than Akhnukh. And this would fit perfectly with what the Old Testament says and the biblical references to Enoch. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, the verse the Bible says, Enoch walked faithfully with God, then he was no more because God took him away. Uh, and in Hebrews uh, chapter 11, verse 5, by faith Enoch was taken away from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. So this motif or notion of Enoch being taken away, being raised up, it seems, and from this as well, and we find to this day in Jewish folkloric tales, the Midrashim and others that are basically, uh, even the Jewish people have what they consider the actual revelation, and then they have their version of Israeliyat, pun intended here, their version of folklore and tales and whatnot. And these are the commentaries that are found of the, uh, uh, of the uh, Old Testament, of the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the ancient books, the five books, the Pentateuch. And... In these uh, Midrashim, in these legends, one finds very similar to what we find in Kaab, that Enoch was taken up to heaven and appointed the guardian of the heavenly treasures and taught all of the secrets and mysteries and so on and so forth. So the stories of Kaab, we actually are able to find equivalents in the Jewish texts. And if anything, it shows us that Kaab was a Jewish rabbi and he's taking from the knowledge he has and frankly, sometimes you find them to be very similar and sometimes you find them to be not that similar. And what this shows, because Kaab is coming from a Yemeni tradition of Judaism, right? So Kaab is a, a Yemeni Jew. And most of these uh, books that we have are Babylonic and, and uh, uh, other places. So even those two sources not being exactly the same makes sense because we don't expect the Yemeni strand of Judaism to be exactly the same as the Babylonic or the Iraqi strand. Uh, interesting point here, Enoch, uh, allegedly wrote a book that is ascribed to him by a sect of Judaism called the Essenes. And uh, you've all heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls and their discovery. So the Dead Sea Scrolls has a book allegedly written by Enoch. It is called the Book of Idris, the Book of Enoch, the Book of Enoch. And it is actually found and whatnot. And of course, we don't believe Enoch actually did this. Now, this is the first opinion. that Idris is Akhnukh or Enoch. And if that were the case, and he is mentioned in the Quran, then chronologically, he should come where I just said him, which is Adam and then Sheath and then Idris according to the biblical genealogy. There is a second opinion, and that is that Idris 
is not Enoch. Rather, Idris is a prophet from the Bani Israel. Idris is a prophet from the Bani Israel, the children of Israel. And uh, he should not be mentioned with Enoch at all. And this hadith is weak anyway, so we are mix mixing up when we say he's Enoch. No, Enoch, according to that opinion, is not mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah. Idris is one of the Israelite prophets. And maybe even he is Elias or Ilyas. Salamun ala Ilyasin, according to one interpretation. And this is the position of Imam al-Bukhari. Imam al-Bukhari leaned towards this opinion. And not only Imam al-Bukhari, but also perhaps some of the Sahaba felt this way as well. It has been narrated from Ibn Mas'ud and Ibn Abbas and others that they thought that the Quranic reference to Ilyas, Salamun ala Ilyasin, that the reference to Ilyas is in fact Idris. And of the evidence that, that they use for this is that when the Prophet went up to Isra Mi'raj and he met Adam, السلام, Adam said to him, Peace be upon you, O noble prophet and O noble son. And when he met Ibrahim, Ibrahim said the same thing. But when he met Isa, Isa did not say my noble son, he said a noble prophet. And when he met Idris as well in the fourth heaven, Idris said, peace be upon you, O noble prophet, uh, uh, o, o righteous prophet, and uh, O noble brother, Akhun Karim. So Idris called him Akhun Karim. And according to this, Imam al-Bukhari says, basically, that if the Prophet had been a descendant of Idris, i.e. if Idris was Enoch, Enoch, then he would not have said, welcome, O noble brother and O noble prophet. He would have said, like Ibrahim and like Adam, O noble brother and O noble, sorry, O noble prophet and O noble son, because Enoch would then be of the uh, ancestors of the Prophet So, Imam al-Bukhari used that phrase which is in his Sahih that Idris says in the fourth heavens to the Prophet ﷺ, Welcome, O noble brother and O noble prophet. The fact that he called him a noble prophet and a noble brother indicates he's not a father. Ibn Hajar comments on this and disagrees with Imam al-Bukhari. And Ibn Hajar says that there is no evidence in this whatsoever. Rather, either one can say that this is a, a mistake from one of the narrators that they're just, you know, they're narrating by meaning. Or he said that Idris is being humble, showing humility and not raising himself to the level of Ibrahim or Adam and saying, oh noble brother. So uh, Ibn Hajar and the majority say Idris is Enoch or Akhnukh. Now, uh, two other things inshallah and then we're done for today. Uh, there is there are references in hadith to a prophet whom many have interpreted to be Idris. It's an authentic hadith reported in Sahih Muslim and in Muslim at Muhammad report, uh, from Muawiyah ibn al-Hakam ibn al-Sulami who said that I asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam about divination by drawing in the sand. Pause here. We need to explain. There's always been weird techniques and methods to predict the future. Reading palms, fortune cards, mashallah, drinking shai, and then, you know, uh, looking at the tea leaves, right? You've all seen these types of things, looking into the crystal ball. And all of them have been uncategorically considered haram. And if you believe that this person knows ilm al ghaib, that this might even be, actually, it is a type of shirk. If you believe he knows ilm al ghaib, this is no doubt it is shirk. So, all such things have been shut. There's also a technique, it's actually still found in some cultures. As far as I'm aware, it's not common in the Western versions of these types of things. It is called Khat al-Raml. And there are various madhabs of Khat al-Raml, but they all center around drawing lines in sand and then deciphering those lines. So you draw, either you get somebody else to draw, right? And so the person, you know, you tell them just to draw something and then you decipher, or uh, you draw somewhat haphazardly, not really thinking things through, and then you analyze what you have drawn. So you, you, like a mystical experience takes over you. And you draw it in the sand with your finger, with a special instrument and whatnot. And if the drawing, in, you know, you, the, the person allegedly looks at it and then predicts the future, says you should get married, you should undertake this journey, don't take, undertake that business. This is called Khattu al-Raml. This is called Khattu al-Raml. Now, Muawiyah ibn, Al-Hakam said, I asked the Prophet about doing Khattu al-Raml. The Prophet was asked about any omen, 
auguries, about reading and omens to birds, about fortune telling. And he kept on saying, and haram, and this is, you know, your salah is not accepted for 40 days, and whoever does this doesn't believe what has been revealed to me. When he was asked about khat al-raml, he gave a very, very, very atypical and interesting and somewhat, yeah, we have to think deeply about it, answer. He said, there used to be a prophet who would write in Ramal. He would draw the Ramal. So, whoever's Ramal, whoever's prediction comes out to be true, it is because of that prophet. What does this mean? What, so the meaning of the hadith is, there used to be a prophet whom Allah gifted this science to. And that prophet, it was a part of his prophecy. That's how Allah gave him the gift. Because that's what prophets do, they predict the future. So there was a prophet who actually did this. And therefore, whoever's prediction of your groups is correct, it is because the remnants of what that prophet did have reached this person. Now, our scholars have interpreted this hadith, and I think legitimately so, uh, with the claim that this is a prohibition, but an indirect one. Instead of saying it's haram, instead of saying not allowed, if the Prophet said it's haram and it's not allowed, that would be problematic insofar as a previous Prophet did it correctly. So the Prophet ﷺ had to say something that respected the right of the previous Prophet to do this while indicating that it's not allowed for the rest of us. And so what he said was, a Prophet of the past used to do this. I can't say anything about that. Some of you guys who are still doing it and you think it is divine, when it actually happens in accordance with reality, when he says something that turns out to be true, it's not because he has some special information. Rather, it's because of what knowledge was given to that prophet, eventually made its way indirectly to this person. But because this person is not a prophet, and because sometimes he's going to be right or wrong, you should not get involved in this science. This is what the majority interpretation has been. Now, what has this got to do with Idris? If you look at any commentary of this hadith, starting from Ibn Hajjah, starting from an Nawi and others, the vast majority of scholars, they say, the reference in this hadith is to Idris. And why do they say this? There's no authentic reference that is Idris. But once again, this uh, narration over here, I quoted it to you before, right? And it explicitly says, He is the first to write with the Qalam. He is the first to write with the Qalam. Now, this notion of writing with the qalam has been interpreted by the majority of scholars that this is a reference to this is a reference to uh, the notion of khattu uh, ramli khattu ramli there is another interpretation based upon this phrase and that interpretation is found in ibn sa'd and others and ibn ishaq even uh, and uh, it is found in al-tabari and that is that they interpreted this phrase at face value and they said idris alayhi salam was the first human being to be blessed with the art of writing. So Allah gifted Adam the ability to speak. Allah gifted Idris the ability to write. Allah gifted Nuh the ability to build ships. Allah gifted Dawood the ability to bend uh, uh, metal and, and, and iron, and so on and so forth. And so the notion came that Idris is the founder of, not even writing, civilization. And you find, again, bizarre you know, statements in past books. Ibn Taghri Bardi, uh, one of the medieval scholars of, of history, actually has even more longer than this. He was the first one to uh, plan a city, right? To have a city planning is Idris, okay? And uh, <laughs> the, the Grand Mufti of Egypt, that person, the Grand Mufti of Egypt actually said that Idris was the one who built the pyramids. Can you believe? Idris was the one who built the pyramids of Egypt. And he actually said, what can we say about this? He actually said that the Sphinx 
represents Idris. It was meant to represent the Prophet Idris. Anyway, so as I said, we stick with the Quran and Sunnah and uh, other people's statements leave, remain other people's. Uh, there is no evidence that uh, Idris was the first to write with a pen. Uh, the notion that he was the first to start writing is also problematic insofar as human writing goes back relatively recent and humanity is far, far, far beyond this. So mankind has been alive since, you know, tens of thousands of years and writing is really relatively recent, only a few thousand years. So if Idris were a Khnukh, and a Khnukh is the great grandfather of Nuh, which means writing is going to predate the flood, then this would change a lot of everything we know about archaeology and history. It would not make any sense. Rather, firstly, what the Prophet ﷺ said, the authentic version is Khat al-Ramil, not the first writing. Khat al-Ramil, which is divination by drawing in sand. And secondly, the authentic hadith does not mention the name of Idris. If it is Idris, no problem, but it's nothing about writing. And then thirdly, to extract from this that he is the founder of civilization, that uh, according to Ibn Sa'd, he's the first one to wear clothes made out of cloth before him. Clothes were made out of leather. So Idris was the first to sew. Idris was the first to build the pyramids. Mashallah, Idris was... The... Again, all of these legends and whatnot, we take them with a grain of salt and we uh, frankly see the humanity of our uh, you know, tradition. And again, it is it is what it is. Astaghfirullah, this is not meant to cast any doubts on our tradition. It is meant for us to be uh, uh, people who understand the difference between what Allah and His Messenger say and between what anybody else says, no matter how respected and great they are in the end of the day. They are human beings who are products of their time and places. And especially when it comes to stories of the past, it is human nature to create these legends and myths and whatnot. And so in the end of the day, this whole hour long lecture, we actually know hardly anything about Sheath and Idris. And frankly, the entire lecture that I have given you, it is so that you know what others say. As for what we ourselves know from the Quran and Sunnah, Sheath, absolutely nothing. And Idris, وَرَفَعْنَاهُ مَكَانَ عَلِيَّ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَدِّيقًا نَبِيَّ And that is about it. We do not even know if Idris was a Khnukh or whether he was Ilyas. Both opinions are plausible and there is no definitive statement that we can say. Therefore, where we do not know, the wiser thing to do is to not claim to know and to remain silent and say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Allah wanted us to know Idris. That's why he says, وَذْكُرْ فِي كِتَابِ إِدْرِيسِ He is a prophet of Allah. We are expected to love and believe in him without even knowing any details about him. And that is what we do. We respect and admire him. We affirm what Allah says, وَرَفَعْنُ مَكَانًا عَلِيَّ And we leave its reality and tafsir to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah with this, I will conclude for today. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. فيا ذلي ويا خجلي إذا ما قال لي ربي أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى رضا الرب تعود إلى رضا الرب